Good morning, everyone. What a beautiful day in New York City today. What an amazing day. The day we have been waiting for, the day we dreamed of. A lot of people didn't know if this day would come. A lot of people doubted, but this day is here. The vaccine is here in New York City. The vaccine will be given out from this day forward. From this day forward, the vaccine will be distributed and we will turn the tide on the coronavirus. This is a day to celebrate. And what a fitting beginning to the day that our healthcare heroes were in the spotlight. The folks who saw us through this whole crisis, what a good day that they're getting the respect they deserve for all they've done for us. So the first person to get the shot here in New York City, the first person vaccinated, critical care nurse, Sandra Lindsay and Sandra, boy, I was so impressed. Sandra didn't even flinch during that shot, but here she is, someone who has been protecting people in Queens, the epicenter of the crisis, saving lives. How fitting that she was the first to get the vaccination, well administered by Dr. Michelle Chester, uh, at Long Island Jewish Hospital, Queens, part of the Northwell system, and everyone, everyone in our healthcare system, we salute you. All our healthcare heroes, we thank you. We're gonna protect you so you can protect all of us. So what an amazing day and the vaccine is here and it will be distributed starting today. You're gonna to start to see more and more people get it. Remember, it starts to be effective even from the first vaccination and fully effective with the second. So we now begin today the largest vaccination effort in the history of New York City. Today is a historic day for many reasons. In New York City history, this will be remembered as the day where the largest mobilization ever was undertaken to protect the people of this city, the largest vaccination effort in our history. Now we're gonna use every tool at our disposal. Our vaccine command center will lead the way. Every single city agency, every city employee will be a part of this to make sure that all New Yorkers are served. Uh, this is going to be a huge undertaking, but nowhere is there the ability and the strength and the know-how more than New York City to get something like this done, and particularly at our health department that has led the way over decades, generations in doing vaccination on a large scale to protect the people of the city. Here to tell you more about it, our health commissioner, Dr. Dave Choksi. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. We've said before that the cavalry is on the way. Good news, of course, uh, but we must acknowledge that it is a slow and steady march. To start, let me try to break down the coming days based on what we know and what we don't yet know. So here's what we know about the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. First, leading scientists have confirmed that it is a very good vaccine in terms of safety and ability to protect against COVID-19 illness. I myself have pored over the studies, including what was released last week. Second, the first New York City bound vaccine shipments departed from Kalamazoo, Michigan yesterday in special cartons uh, at, held at minus 70 degrees. They will travel via UPS and FedEx, both by truck and by plane. Third, Pfizer equipped the coolers with GPS-enabled thermal sensors so the temperature can be monitored and the vaccines tracked to ensure they are received safely. If there are any problems with the shipments, Pfizer will notify us immediately. Fourth, our first vaccines are arriving today at five hospitals. That means that vaccines will become vaccinations today in New York City. Subsequent shipments are expected at 37 hospitals on Tuesday and two more hospitals on Wednesday. Fifth, hospitals are ready and waiting for the vaccine. And after the initial vaccinations, the data will be reported to our citywide immunization registry within 24 hours of administration. So we can securely keep track of who is getting the vaccine. Now, beyond the logistics, uh, let me just take a moment to acknowledge what a remarkable and poignant milestone in our fight against COVID-19. And now here are a few things that remain unknown. First, we don't yet know whether the Pfizer vaccine works for children under the age of 16. 
the FDA authorization was for ages 16 and up. Second, this week, the Moderna vaccine is expected to get a similar FDA review as the Pfizer vaccine did. We don't know the detailed results yet, but depending on them, the FDA's emergency authorization could come as soon as Friday. Third, we don't know our overall allotment of Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for New York City over the coming months, but we have been told to plan for approximately 465,000 doses over weeks one, two, and three. Throughout the process, we will be communicating with hospitals to answer questions and share updated guidance. We will also be monitoring incoming data, preparing subsequent orders, and working with community partners to spread facts and foresight. While help is on the way, I'd like to add one thing. We remain in a state of emergency. If your house is on fire, you don't stay among the flames waiting for the fire department to arrive. You take the steps needed to stay safe. So until every last ember is extinguished, we are asking you to stay safe by masking up, staying home if you feel ill, keeping your distance, washing your hands, and getting, getting tested. We are still in this together, and the core four precautions are what will keep you, your friends, and your family healthy. When it's my turn, I look forward to rolling up my sleeves to receive the vaccine. Until then, I'm taking heart in the fact that my hospital colleagues are getting one more layer of protection, and I'll keep taking the steps that I can to protect them as well as others, particularly those who are at greatest risk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Choksi. And yes, our hospitals have been preparing for this day. The folks who protect all of us have been getting ready. Uh, nowhere has that been more true than in our public hospitals and clinics, health and hospitals. Uh, we depend on so much in this city and health and hospitals, hospitals were the, bearing the brunt of this crisis during that time when we were the epicenter. They were going through some of the toughest reality so they know they are battle veterans they know how important it is to distribute this vaccine and get it right here to tell you about all the efforts being made in our public hospital system ceo of health and hospitals dr mitch katz well thank you so much mr mayor and thank you for your uh, continued support of the public hospital system without you i think several years ago when health and hospitals was so close to financial ruin there would be no health and hospital system but you saved it and i think it's proven what a great investment that is Amen. it's really uh, risen to the occasion i want people to understand how difficult it is to be a doctor or a nurse in the midst of a pandemic um, you're wearing all of your gear um, but you're still worried, is this infection going to come home with me? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to bring this infection home to my children, to my spouse? And then all of a sudden, you're intubating a fellow nurse, your charge nurse, the nurse who kept you safe. You're intubating a fellow doctor. You work beside her uh, for all the weeks of the pandemic. What a horrible, horrible thing. And I'm so pleased that everyone recognizes that the healthcare workers should be at the top of the list. They've done their job. They're continuing to do their job. They need to be protected. They need to be kept healthy so that they uh, do not go out sick, but can be there for all of us if we should need their, their help at a hospitalization. And we're very proud of health and hospitals being able to receive the vaccine. We've been preparing for it. We will be focusing in the first weeks on those people who are at the highest risk of being exposed to COVID in the hospital. Those are people who are working with patients who have a breathing tube. That breathing tube causes more virus to be in the air. Because of that, we want the nurses, the ICU nurses, the respiratory therapists, uh, the anesthesiologists, the emergency room doctors, we want them to be vaccinated first. We look forward to, with the mayor and Dr. Chotsky, to being part of the broader effort after we've done the healthcare workers to do the broad population of New York City. There is no more trusted provider to the low-income communities of New York City than health and hospitals. We take care of over a million people a year. 400,000 choose us as their primary source of care. Uh, we are known in the immigrant communities as a safe place to be 
cared for, a place where you will not get crippling bills, a place where no one will report you, a place where if you're homeless and poor, you'll be treated with dignity and respect. And we look forward to being part of that effort. And Mr. Mayor, we agree, Dr. Chotsky and you, that till then, we'll all do our best to stay safe. Thank Amen. you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Dr. Katz, to you and your whole team for everything you're doing to protect us. Hey, everyone, look, we in this city, we're going to show the world once again what New York City can do. We're going to be distributing this vaccine quickly and effectively. We're also going to be doing it equitably. We're going to be doing it fairly for the folks who need it the most, for the neighborhoods that need it the most. Our command center is going to lead the way to make sure things keep moving and that things are done the right way. But in the meantime, uh, just as we get this amazing good news, we are dealing with this second wave here in New York City. We are not done yet with the coronavirus. So let's celebrate today. Let's be hopeful. It is a shot of hope. Let's be clear. It's not just a shot in the medical sense. It's a shot of hope. But we have to keep fighting this virus in the meantime. So we remain vigilant. We're going to have a tough December, a tough January. You heard the doctor say, continue to take those precautions so that we can move forward. Now, uh, one of the precautions in the state of New York made a decision, and I agree with that decision, uh, was to uh, tighten up some of our restrictions. And as of this morning, uh, indoor dining uh, is no longer in effect in New York City for the foreseeable future. Again, the more we fight back against the disease, the more the vaccine is distributed, that situation will change and sooner rather than later, I believe. But those restrictions are in effect now. Uh, indoor dining is not happening, but outdoor dining continues, takeout and uh, delivery continue. Uh, look, the, the folks who work in our restaurant industry, they've been through hell, let's be clear. Um, I feel for every one of them, I feel for the folks who created a restaurant with their bare hands, had an idea, made it happen, employed people, I feel for the hundred or thousand or more New Yorkers working in the industry right now and so many more are used to. We've got to bring this industry back. We've got to bring back the restaurants we love, but it's going to take time. In the meantime, we've got to stay safe because this second wave is very, very real. So we need to protect each other. We need people to be alive so they can next year feel what it's like to go back to eating indoors and celebrating our holidays with our families. We've got to protect people now. And if we're really going to have that recovery we deserve, we need that stimulus. Still no clear direction coming from Washington, but we're going to keep fighting for a stimulus that actually allows the small businesses in New York City to recover and the renters in New York City to recover and the people of New York City to recover and our economy to come back. That's what we'll keep fighting for. That's what we need. We need it now and we're going to need it when Joe Biden steps into the White House as our president. Okay, quick update. Uh, obviously, as we continue so much important work, one of the really bright spots has been our public schools. Our kids are safe. Our educators and staff are safe. Learning is going on right now in New York City. Uh, 878 schools opened in the course of last week. Uh, we are going to make sure that those schools remain safe, but we're also going to systematically move those schools to five day a week education for as many kids as possible in as many schools as possible. Each school will be different, but we're gonna keep you updated each week on how that progress is going. So we're one week into it, and this week we'll have about 250 schools where kids will be going five days a week, either all kids or most kids, or at minimum, the priority kids we've talked about, kids who live in shelter, kids who live in public housing, kids with special needs. So five day a week education growing week by week in New York City. You're gonna be seeing a lot more as we move forward. We'll keep you updated, but really credit to our educators, credit to the staff, everyone working so hard to make sure our kids get as many days in school as possible. All right, let's go over today's indicators. Number one, daily number of people admitted to New York City hospitals for suspected COVID-19. Today's report is 185 patients. It's under our threshold of 200. That's the good news, but it's still way too high. And it's been a, a tough stretch lately, obviously. A new indicator that we have the hospitalization rate per 100,000 people, uh, 2.73 today. We want to get that under two. Uh, second, we're going over every day now 
both the probable and confirmed cases of the coronavirus on a seven-day average. Today's number, a very high number, 2,137. Again, we want to stay under 550. It's going to take us a long time to get back there, but we will. And number three, uh, this is the percentage of New York City residents testing positive seven-day rolling average. Today's report, 5.5%. We want to get back under five and then keep going lower, lower all the time, and the vaccine is going to be leading the way. A few words in Spanish. Hoy es un día histórico. La vacuna ya está aquí en la ciudad de Nueva York. Todos estamos listos para empezar la operación más importante de este siglo y proteger millones de vidas. Vacunar a todos los neoquinos va a tomar meses y mientras debemos seguir luchando para mantener este virus bajo control. With that, we turn to our colleagues in the media and please let me know the name and outlet of each journalist. Good morning, all. We'll now begin our Q&A. As a reminder, we're joined today by Dr. Choksi, by Dr. Katz, by Commissioner Deanne Criswell, and by Senior Advisor Dr. Jay Varma. The first question today will go to Emma Fitzsimmons from The New York Times. Hi. Good morning, Mayor. Um, hey. How are you doing, so can Emma? Can you tell us? Um, hi. I'm good. Um, so can you tell us which other hospitals are going to be receiving um, the doses today and um, you know, what your plans are for the rest of the day? Sure, Emma. I'll start with uh, my plans and pass to Dr. Choksi to talk about distribution. And as Dr. Choksi said, we'll always tell you what is confirmed, what we can say is absolutely fact. And, you know, when we are not certain yet of a specific detail, we're going to tell you that too, because this is going to be an ever evolving situation in the coming days. So I will say in my case, I'll be at a hospital here in the city this afternoon. Uh, to have another great moment where a New Yorker gets vaccinated. But those details are still coming together. We'll let you know as soon as that happens. Dr. Choksi, uh, let's make sure we give people that which we know, but also acknowledge that which we're still waiting to learn. Absolutely, Mr. Mayor. Um, what I can just add uh, briefly to that is that uh, we do know that, uh, that vaccine shipment is on the way to five hospitals today. Um, with the remaining uh, of the 54 um, that we expect to get vaccine to get their shipments either on Tuesday or uh, Wednesday. As we get more confirmation about um, precise uh, deliveries, um, that's additional information that we can share over time. Go ahead, Emma. Thanks. And can you tell us a little bit about um, how you heard about its arrival? We heard that state officials were tracking the arrival of the vaccine through a UPS phone app. Um, so can you talk about how you learned the news and then um, maybe the emotion or how you felt when you were watching the vaccination take place today, if you watched it? Abs I did. Um, absolutely beautiful moment. A beautiful moment. Uh, look, there was such to me, it was not just a moment where hope was realized. I felt that deeply, like just that when I saw, you know, normally we don't love needles, right? But this is a needle I'm very happy about. So when I saw the needle go into the nurse's arm, I just felt this welling up of hope, uh, an amazing sense of like, we actually are turning the corner. It's actually here. And uh, it was extraordinary. It was amazing that she didn't flinch. That's a true professional. But you know, to me, we were watching an incredibly historic moment and the beginning of something much better for this city and this country. Um, also, the sense of fairness, the sense of justice, that it was a healthcare worker who got the first uh, shot, that uh, the folks who went through such hell to protect all of us and often haven't really been given the full credit they deserve, uh, you know, them getting the opportunity to be honored with the first shot made a lot of sense for me. I have often been in churches lately, and I quote the scriptural uh, point that's so deep, so powerful, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. To see folks who often don't get their due uh, honored with the first shot, um, that was really powerful. So with that, in terms of how we have been uh, working with the state on information and, and the tracking, I'll turn to Dr. Choksi. Um, sure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I'll, I'll just add briefly, um, it, certainly it makes your, uh, makes your heart swell just to think about um, what it means 
uh, for people who have uh, who have given of themselves uh, to to protect others, um, now getting uh, some protection for themselves as well. Um, and with respect to the logistics of, of tracking, uh, the way that it works is that um, we, uh, as well as the state, uh, are notified when, uh, when shipments occur. Um, that's from the Pfizer uh, manufacturing plant in Kalamazoo. Um, once that happens, it's the hospitals that then take the ultimate um, uh, you know, information flow around precisely how a shipment um, makes it to uh, the loading dock of their hospital. Uh, that information, of course, is, um, is something that has to remain uh, secure, uh, but we're in constant communication with hospitals to uh, both give them what they should expect uh, and make sure that they have the plans in place to receive the vaccine appropriately, um, but, but they're also telling us as they receive it as well. I just want to take one quick moment to recognize, you know, a lot of times people talk about uh, the differences in our country. I think it's a moment to show appreciation for our fellow Americans who did the work to create this vaccine. And I want to shout out the folks who work in that factory in Kalamazoo, Michigan, uh, that have gotten this ready for all the rest of us. The spotlight of the world is on Kalamazoo, Michigan, and they deserve our praise and appreciation. So shout out to everyone in Kalamazoo. Thank you for what you're doing for all of us. Go ahead. The next is Marsha from WCBS. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing today? A very historic day for New York City. Uh, it's such a great day, Marsha. I am uh, I'm floating on air today, let me tell you. So I wanted to, my first question is, I, I wanted to ask you about the indoor restaurants. Um, how long do you think that the restaurants will have to remain closed for indoor dining, uh, knowing that the holiday spread is such a huge issue? Marsha, look, I think we all have it within our power to fight back this virus and overcome it in the weeks ahead. But they're going to be tough weeks. December and January are going to be very tough. We're, we're looking at this constant growth of the disease in this second wave. It's really, really worrisome. So this action that the state took was necessary. Uh, the governor said in a New York Times interview over the weekend uh, that we should prepare for the possibility of a full shutdown. I agree with that. We, we need to recognize that that may be coming and we've got to get ready for that now because we cannot let this virus keep growing, especially at a moment where we are finally getting the vaccine and can turn the corner. So I would say to you, I think December is very tough. January is tough. I think after that, we get a chance to really come back strong. Go ahead, Marsha. So my second question has to do with the outdoor dining. If you, if you go and look at some of the outdoor dining facilities that people have uh, put up, many of them have just a single door to get in or a, an air slit. And the state has said that you have to have at least two open sides to qualify for outdoor dining. So my question to you is what is the city going to do in terms of inspecting these facilities and saying that they pass muster? Are you gonna go out and tell people, hey, listen, this doesn't work. You have to open a window, you have to open a side. Are you gonna give them citations? What's gonna happen? It's been an ongoing uh, effort to get uh, every one of the outdoor dining establishments uh, to make sure they're in full compliance with law, they're healthy, they're safe. Uh, restaurant owners have worked really hard with city agencies, Department of Health and others to get it right. But remember, um, some are doing outdoor dining, others are following the rules of indoor dining and they have very few people in them. It depends on how they've set up. The important thing is to make sure that they follow all the state guidance and our folks will be there uh, to make it happen. And we've gotten a lot of compliance. I mean, I want to be clear. There's still things that have to be made better, no question. But the restaurant owners and the restaurant staff have really been trying to work with us because they know how important it is to keep people safe. The next is Andrew Siff from WNBC. Yes, uh, Mayor, good morning. And good morning to everyone on the call. Uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, witness this shot here at LIJ uh, on the eastern edge of Queens here today. Um, I'm wondering how quickly do you think the other vaccinations can take place at this facility at other New York City hospitals today? We had been hearing last week, I think Mark Levine told us he thought it might be 200 people per facility per day. Do you have any better clarification on how quickly this can ramp up? 
Dr. Choksi, then Dr. Katz. So, uh, thank you, Andrew, for that question. Yes, it's a really important question because, of course, we want to make sure that the vaccine gets to um, as many people uh, as quickly as possible. Um, there are some considerations, though, to do this uh, safely, um, to do it in a way uh, that makes sure that um, the, the healthcare systems themselves uh, take into account uh, some of the um, side effects that may affect uh, staff as well. So um, what we've been uh, doing in discussion with our colleagues at hospitals is to make sure that they have a plan in place with respect to uh, scheduling uh, staggered appointments so that it's not uh, people all from the same unit getting vaccinated on the same day. Um, you know, little things make a big difference with the logistics here. For example, giving someone an appointment uh, to get the vaccine the day before they're scheduled to have a day off. Um, that's something that can make a big difference with respect to making sure that, um, that they do okay, you know, after they get that vaccination. Uh, so with that said, the plan is uh, for, uh, you know, the doses that are getting delivered over the next three days uh, to be methodically uh, and gradually used over uh, the next week to a uh, week and a half overall. Thank you. Dr. Katz. Uh, I very much agree with what jo Dr. Chotsky has said. We should be, we'll be able to fully use our supply um, in this first day. Uh, certainly, everybody should focus on making sure that their process is done well, that it's done safely. This is a vaccine that the world has never seen before. There's never been an mRNA vaccine. It, it has to be taken care of in very special conditions. It can only be out of the freezer for a certain amount of time. But once the process is mechanized, I think it will start to go very fast. And I know health and hospitals, we've uh, hired a whole group of nurses specifically to focus on giving vaccinations so that there is no delay. As soon as supply comes, we'll be able to immunize people. Go ahead, Thank Andrew. You. Shifting gears to weather, uh, the Department of Sanitation sent guidance that Restaurants need to remove their outdoor space if there is 12 inches of snow in the forecast. And uh, from what we're seeing right now, the forecast is right on the bubble in some areas for that. So what is your recommendation to restaurants at this point with regard to the storm this week? Look, we'll get out specific guidance through emergency management. I mean, right now it is on the bubble and I would not urge anyone to act yet till we get more clarity. Um, we understand each restaurant's in a different situation. And, and it's really important to understand, Andrew, the best of all worlds is when they have the ability to easily remove uh, what they have built for outdoor dining. For some, that's a lot harder than for others. Um, but we also want to be clear that when we expect major snow, it's in their interest and everyone's interest to clear away as much of their equipment as possible to facilitate the snow cleaning and protect their equipment. So uh, this one, to me, we're still on the cusp right now. Uh, emergency management will get more information out in the next 24 hours and we get a clearer picture. Let me see if our commissioner of emergency management, Deanne Criswell, wants to add anything. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, you're, you're spot on. Right now, we're still watching it. It looks like it's 6 to 12 inches, so it's right on the cusp. Uh, we are meeting with the National Weather Service three times a day to get updates. Um, and we'll get more definitive information out tomorrow to everybody on, on the exact steps that they need to take. Thank you very much. Go ahead. The next is Emily from New York One. Good morning, everyone. How you doing, Emily? I'm well. Thank you very much. May Happy Vaccine Day. Happy V Day. Happy V Day, v -day right. Uh, man. May I please ask you about the, the hard hit communities uh, that you discussed Friday, the ones you want to prioritize for vaccine distribution? Um, I'm hearing what everyone's saying about uh, getting limited quality quantities in the first couple uh, shipments. But, but what do we tell those communities about when they can expect to get the vaccine, how, how they'll be able to access it? Yeah, I want to turn to Dr. Choksi and Dr. Varma. But look, I think the key point, Emily, is we've said very clearly, everyone said federal, state, local, uh, healthcare workers, frontline, most vulnerable and nursing home staff, nursing home residents, that's where we're all focused first. 
We're going to be focusing on other healthcare workers, first responders. We're going to then be focusing on the most vulnerable people, folks over 65, folks with pre existing conditions, or especially folks who have both. But when we do that, we're going to really put an emphasis on the 27 neighborhoods that were most hard hit by COVID. That's neighborhoods of color in this city, black, Latino, Asian. And we're going to make sure uh, that they get their fair share. That's the basic concept. But to give you a little more flavor of how that play out, first Dr. Choksi, then Dr. Varma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, that's exactly right uh, with respect to um, how we see this unfolding over the coming uh, weeks and months. Uh, the priority, as the mayor just said, is that uh, the coming weeks will be focused on people who are at uh, greatest risk, and particularly at greatest risk of, of severe uh, outcomes from COVID-19 illness. Uh, we um, hope and plan that there will be enough vaccine supply in the early months of 2021 for us to start expanding the circle out uh, beyond that. Um, and that's where uh, these considerations that we have made central to our plan around equity uh, will, will really be brought to bear. Um, so a little bit more about the how to your question. Well, what we know is that the most important thing with respect to um, making sure that people who are in those hard hit neighborhoods actually uh, get the vaccine is to rely on the places that they already trust. Uh, whether it's a relationship that they have with their primary care doctor or the local clinic or their local pharmacy. Um, and so we're, we're going to rely on that for distribution, but also rely on trusted messengers in those communities to communicate about the vaccine. Dr. Varma. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on on one aspect that, I, that Dr. Shakshi uh, mentioned in, in his opening statement, which is um, there are things that, that we're waiting for also. Um, and so I think that today is an incredibly uh, uh, hopeful and, and exciting day because we have the first of our vaccines. But there are more vaccines coming. We know the Moderna vaccine, which is very similar to the Pfizer one, um, is likely to get uh, authorized very soon. Uh, there are evaluations of, a, of another U.S.-grown product, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So uh, I think what's going to be important for uh, communities throughout the city is um, to continue to listen to the updated guidance that they're getting. And as Dr. Chakshi has mentioned, talk to your trusted health care providers because there's going to be a lot of information. It's going to be challenging uh, to sift through at the time. Uh, we're going to do our best to constantly communicate and, and make it clear, but um, learning and, and trying to understand what's happening is going to be helpful so that when your turn in line comes, um, you're going to be ready to know about making the right decision for your own health. Thank you. Go ahead, Emily. Thank you all. Uh, the second one, my second question is regarding uh, safety measures at Rikers, um, considering the surge um, Congresswoman Alexander Ocasio-Cortez has issued a letter to the DOC uh, raising her concerns and asking uh, what you're doing for the individual, individuals there concerning they're not sentenced uh, to death by virus there. Uh, look, uh, Emily, it's an important question and one where uh, New York City has a very clear track record. And I worked very closely uh, with our correction team, our health and hospitals team that provides the health care at uh, Rikers and other jails, and I want to thank Dr. Katz and all of his colleagues at Health and Hospitals who work in our correction system. They don't get a lot of credit, but they deserve it because they do really good and important work, so I thank them. Um, as we were dealing with the first wave, uh, the great unknown, everyone was trying to make sense of the situation, uh, this city made a bold decision, uh, working with DAs, working with the state. Uh, we ultimately had about 1,600 uh, inmates come out of our jail system as a protective measure, given what was happening then. It was a different situation now, thank God. Uh, correctional health is much better positioned to address uh, the virus because everyone's learned so much more. We have a lot of space that we are using because the population, particularly at Rikers, went so low that we have a lot of available space. We're able to spread people out. We're screening anyone who comes in, uh, whether employee or uh, inmate to make sure uh, that we know their situation. Uh, it's a much, much better situation now. That said, we're watching it very carefully. The last report I got, Emily, was the infection rate in our correction system was lower than the infection rate for the whole city. But that said, we're watching carefully, we're preparing steps uh, to make sure we can protect people and make moves as we get more information. The next is Rich Lamb from WCBS 880. Uh, 
Good morning. Congratulations, I guess, Mr. Mayor and the team there. Congratulations uh, to out. everyone, Rich. It's, uh, it's an amazing cool. day for all of us. Uh, just an aside here. Did you know that, uh, that Pfizer started in Brooklyn in 1849? I did not know that. I know they're a great New York City company, but I didn't know that they go back that far. That's pretty amazing. So it's a proud day for New York City leading the country again. Yeah. So uh, this is a uh, yes. Well, and true uh, is a, so uh, this is an intramuscular shot, from what I understand, not intravenous. And, and they, we've heard about this ultra cold storage. So how cold is the vaccine? when it's injected and can you feel that i mean you know this it's almost like I, one would think it's almost solid in the way it's when it's uh, at that low temperature or must be frozen solid i guess i have to say before i turn to uh dr choksi i was so impressed again by uh sandra Lindsay, who just didn't even blink when she got the shot in her uh in her shoulder there uh obviously she did not see any negative reaction. It looked pretty smooth. But Dr. Choksi, talk to us about the temperature and what it feels like, et cetera. Sure. At first, Rich, thanks for that fun Pfizer fact. I wasn't aware of it fun either. Fun Pfizer fact. That was very <laughs> alliterative. Go ahead. Um, so to, to return the favor with respect to the information about, uh, about the temperature of the vaccine, you're right. When it's stored, it's at ultra cold uh, temperatures, but it does get thawed before uh, it's administered, you know, before it's injected as an intramuscular shot. So generally that will be at, uh, at room temperature. Uh, it takes about um, 30 minutes for, uh, for the vaccine to thaw from ultra cold temperatures to room temperature if you just leave it out uh, at room temperature. Um, it takes about three hours for it to thaw from ultra cold to placing it in a refrigerator. Uh, if it is placed in a refrigerator, um, then when it's mixed for the shot, um, it will further uh, thaw. So you shouldn't experience any sensation of coldness upon getting the vaccine. Go ahead, Rich. Okay. And I'm just wondering if Dr. K uh, Katz can go over exactly who is getting the, sh uh, the first shots and, and what the thinking is in regard to that. I heard something along those lines, but I wondered if we can know uh, what the thinking, what, why people are in the most danger, who is the, or who are the people, and what's the, uh, you know, how does it work? Certainly. So the people in a hospital who are at the most danger are people who are doing procedures that aerosolize the virus, meaning send the virus particles into the air. That usually means there's some pressure, and the common instance of that is patients who are on a breathing tube where a tube is placed down their throat in order to use a ventilator to push in air, and that causes uh, air to be pushed out and the virus into the air. So the people who most deal with those tubes are respiratory therapists, ICU nurses, which is I'm sure why, uh, Mr. Mayor, you saw the ICU nurse getting the vaccine today, uh, emergency room physicians who intubate patients, uh, those would be the people at highest risk and the ones we're doing first. What Dr. Chotsky referred to, which is also an important issue, is some people will have mild flu-like symptoms the next day or two after getting the vaccine. Well, we don't want to therefore vaccinate in one hospital every ICU nurse and therefore risk that we have no ICU nurses to take care of patients on the next day. So we'll stagger it. We might do it Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for a third of the ICU nurses, and then a third, and then a third. Or as uh, uh, Dr. Chotsky says, we will look when we know people are off, and therefore we'll be able to uh, get through the mild, mild symptoms uh, without having to come to work with them. So though th that's basically how we'll be administering it. Thank you very much. Go ahead. The next is Jake Offenharts at Gothamist. Hey, good morning, Mr. Mayor. Hey, Jake, how you been? I'm pretty good. Um, you, you mentioned the, the possibility of a full shutdown in the coming weeks, and I was hoping you kind of elaborate on what that would look like. Are we talking, you know, the same size shutdown as we saw in March, um, something different you're envisioning. I also know the, the chair of the City Council Health Committee has mentioned, uh, you know, calling for the closure of non-essential office spaces. So are you at a point right now where you would recommend New Yorkers who don't need to go into an office don't? Yeah, look, uh, Jake, first of all, 
This is a constant conversation that I'm having with the governor, my team's having with the state all the time. And what is increasingly clear is that all forms of restrictions have to be on the table at this point. The governor's quote in the Times, I think, said it exactly right. And the current rate we're going, you have to be ready now for a full shutdown, a pause like we had uh, back at the, uh, the end of the spring. And that is, I think, increasingly necessary just to break the back of the second wave, to stop the second wave from growing, to stop it from taking lives, to stop it from threatening our hospitals. So we're working carefully with the state. The state will ultimately make the decision. I certainly do agree that folks who don't need to be going into a workplace at this point uh, should do as much as they can remotely. Uh, again, I, I think there's the likelihood of more restrictions quite soon, so folks should start making those adjustments now uh, and get ready to work remotely if they can. Uh, hopefully we're talking about restrictions only for a matter of weeks, but we have to be uh, preparing ourselves mentally and you know, practically for that possibility. Go ahead. Okay, and on education, you, you mentioned that there are 250 public schools um, where some of the neediest students are able to go five days a week. Um, and how many of these schools can all students go five days a week? We'll get to the updated numbers uh, as they keep emerging. Uh, Jake, I think what's really important for everyone to understand is this is going to literally improve each week. So this week going into next week, we have only a few days of school and then everyone comes back on January 4th. Uh, you're going to see improvement throughout this week. On January 4th, you're going to see a lot of improvement. My goal, the chancellor's goal, maximum number of schools out of that 878 schools that are up and running, maximum number go to full five day a week for all their kids. The next best category is five day a week for most kids. And the next best category is five day a week, at least for the kids with greatest need. Uh, we're going to be able to do that, uh, I think, very successfully across those 878 schools. In terms of exactly how many we'll get into each category, we'll know a lot more in the coming days. But I think the, the thing to envision is when we come back on January 4th, uh, you're going to see a big jump up of the number of schools that are doing five day a week education. And we'll keep going from there. We'll keep improve upon it every week thereafter. We have time for two more for today. The next is Amanda Eisenberg from Politico. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Happy Vaccine Day, Amanda. How are you? Happy Vaccine Day. I cried watching that video, so I'm very happy. I, uh, I appreciate it. I think this is going to be a new, <laughs> a new question. Do you cry when you watch vaccine videos? So I think that shows After you have a lot of heart. Year? <laughs> no, yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you, my first question is, when do you expect to get the vaccine within this priority schema considering Trump and his staffers are among the first to get the vaccine. Uh, the man who's going to make that decision is sitting right here. I, I really think it's important for public officials to follow the guidance of their health leadership. Um, I will go by my priority status whenever that is, unless for any reason the health leadership determines otherwise. So let me pass the uh, question to the person who will make the decision, Dr. Choksi. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I just want to say the mayor has been very uh, upfront and clear about um, about uh, his wanting uh, advice from uh, from me as a health commissioner, from the rest of the health team uh, about this very question. Uh, and really, it, it brings to bear issues of uh, of fairness. Uh, and so uh, the mayor will um, will get the vaccine, uh, you know, sort of as the prioritization um, is. Uh, is laid out over the coming weeks. Uh, right now, as you know, um, the first priority is high-risk hospital workers, as well as people who are in uh, long-term care facilities, both residents and staff. Uh, so it will be after that phase uh, at some point that, um, that the mayor will get his vaccine. I think the really important thing is uh, when he does get it, um, the symbol that that shows with respect to confidence in the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. Amen. Okay, go ahead, Amanda. Great, thank you. And then uh, my second question is is in regards to the Satmar funeral. Uh, the New York Post wrote a couple of stories over the weekend, and so I was wondering um, to find out what you're hoping to glean from your investigation that wasn't already available via photos and social media. 
Yeah, it's a good question, Amanda. Look, a lot of times the photos in social media give us a very partial view. Um, when we're talking about the potential of shutting down a building uh, and not allowing anyone in, we want to make sure we get it exactly right. I'll get an update on the investigation uh, and we'll, we'll certainly make public what we've found. But I think that you know, we're, we're going to continue to talk to community leaders to make sure that they understand that these rules must be followed. And if not, uh, and no one wants to shut down the building, but if we see that there hasn't been compliance, we will shut down the building. Go ahead. The last question for today goes to Gersh from Streets Blog. Hello, Mr. Mayor. How are you? Congratulations. Congratulations to all, Gersh. And uh, I, I want to see if there's a transportation-related vaccine question here. I'm, I'm ready. Uh, well, there isn't really, but I will follow up on Marsha's question, which was legitimate. So... As you know, we see these structures in the street now for the open restaurants. Many of them have opaque uh, sidewalls, meaning even though they remain set back from the intersections, car drivers can't see pedestrians and vice versa. So I've asked DOT many times to document how many inspections it has done and how many restaurants have been cited for blocking view sheds that you guys put into the rules. And the only answer I've gotten is many. So I'm wondering if you can instruct the DOT to provide the actual number of restaurants that have been cited for creating dangerous street conditions with walls that cannot be seen through. And I'd love to get your comments on that. Now, look, I'm really glad you're raising it. And, you know, Gersh, uh, something I like to say when a journalist raises a point that helps us focus on things we need to do better or things we you know need to check up on i find it very helpful so i want to thank you for that because i am a vision zero believer and i'm also an, uh, an outdoor dining believer and uh open dining open streets this has been an amazing uh, step forward for this city but it has to be safe so I will uh, get you an answer because we do need to make sure that we've done that piece right. We got to keep everyone safe while we're also trying to protect people's livelihoods uh, and give people a real sense of this city uh, able to recover soon. But I'll get you an answer on that. Go ahead. Okay. And my second question, I will ask a COVID vaccine related transportation question. I'm able to do that moving on the fly. You said the other day that you would obviously take the vaccine to demonstrate that it is safe. You're obviously excited about the vaccine. Given that study after study show that transit is also safe and that transit is really suffering because a lot of people think it's unsafe, maybe you would start riding transit maybe for a week just to show that it's safe. And now I know in the past you have said that such a mayoral demonstration is, quote, cheap symbolism. But maybe in this case it isn't. Tell me what you think. I, I you respectfully, old friend, you're you're taking that quote out of context. That was a quote about a different matter, um, which I did feel at the time. But this is a different matter. I agree with you. Uh, it is important to let people know the subways are safe. I like the idea of having a period of time to really emphasize to people that they're safe by being out there. So I accept that good idea. And we'll figure out when the right time to do that is, and we'll do it, and we will surely invite you along. Everybody, as we conclude today, uh, what an amazing day. Let's just, you know, after everything we've been through this whole year, and it has been a long, long year, um, we will not look back on 2020 fondly. However, let's give 2020 its due in the midst of this horrible pandemic an amazing human effort all over the world to come up with this vaccine. And it was done in record time. And now everyone is putting their shoulder to the wheel to make sure that this vaccine gets to all the people in the city who need it as quickly as possible. Look, there's some justice in the fact that we were the epicenter where the first wave dealt with the brunt of this crisis. And now we're gonna be in the first wave of fighting back getting this vaccine out as quickly or more quickly than any place else in the country, protecting our people. Uh, New York City is going to show the whole world how quickly and well we can get this vaccine to the people who need it. But remember, vaccine is part of the answer. It's going to ultimately be the biggest part of the answer. But right now, it still depends on you. We got one last big battle in December and January. We got to fight back this virus so we can give the vaccine time to do its work. So everyone, please remember the mask, the distancing. If you're traveling, don't travel. Cancel your travel. Stay close. Small gatherings. 
help each other. And when the opportunity comes to get that vaccine, go get it. When it's your priority time, go get it. I'm going to do it. Our health leadership's going to do it. We do all these things right. We're going to get through this last fight and finally turn the page on the coronavirus. Thank you, everyone.